Lion Wrestling Network, World Heavyweight Champion. And make sure you tune into the Lions Vlog every week. You heard it here first. Straight from Bobby. Can you believe that there are some people in this world that did not tune in to the Alliance Vlog Podcast? Shame on you! Shame on you! My name is Ella Indy and I'm one half of the NWA Women's World Tag Team Champion. And I'm Kinsey Page, the other half of the NWA World Women's Tag Team Champion. And you better go listen to the Alliance Vlog what you call it? Podcast, period. You're ugly. You're You're ugly. power approved. Are you ready? Power. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! What we've got here is failure to communicate. I'm building an alliance. God bless the internet. Okay, let's party. It's showtime. It's time for the Alliance Guys Podcast, with your hosts Kevin Frazier, Jaden, DKM, and J. Cal. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the special edition of the Alliance Guys Podcast, a presentation of Alliance-Wrestling.com, your number one source for news and information for the National Wrestling Alliance and the United Wrestling Network. I'm J. Cal, and tonight we have a special interview with a good friend of mine. And a special project that he's working on that I think you guys will be really interested in checking out. It's called Blood and Paint. But uh, let me introduce you to my friend, Brandon. Brandon Knoll of Destiny's Comics. Brandon, what's up, my friend? How are you? Oh, yeah. Dig it. Green rises to the top. Sorry. Top. Tippy top. Uh, Thank you for having me on. Yeah, man. Glad to have you here. We've been talking about doing this for a while now, so I'm glad that you're able to join us here on the Alliance Guys podcast and just talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. We It turns out we have a, a mutual friend, which was really weird because I started seeing your stuff online before I knew you were friends with Eduardo. So it's kind of cool that uh, uh, we have this connection out here in the uh, Hemacito area, if you will. But uh what what drew me to what you were doing, um, and of course we'll get into all of it. But uh, you were posting these great uh, these paintings of WCW art with the hashtag WCW on Wednesdays, of course, which threw a monkey wrench in all the plans of people who are trying to profess their love for internet models and fiancés. And I thought that was awesome and, and hilarious. But uh, some of your artwork uh, really like. Uh, connected with me because like you i grew up a fan of wcw and so i don't want to steal too much more of your thunder but let's get right into it what was the plan when you started your instagram account and these hashtag wcws what was what was going on in your head and and let's talk about that first about four years ago i saw the i'm not i'm not an internet savvy guy internet culture moves way too fast um (laughs) And I get left behind a lot of the times, and that's that's okay. Um, but I saw WCW was trending on, like, Twitter then, now X. Um, and I thought, oh, new documentary, new tell-all book. Like, what what's, you know, why is WCW trending? And I, I came to learn that the next generation, Gen Z or whatever, uh, WCW to them means Women Crush Wednesday. And so it was an excuse to post photos of lovely ladies in bikinis and n- there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> but uh to me wcw will always be world championship wrestling like this was the first time that society or culture was moving on without me like no wcw doesn't mean that and it now means this new thing um and it just boggled my mind that This was a multi-billion dollar corporation in the 90s. And that you can just, it it never happened. It never existed. Um, So as a cartoonist and painter, I started posting every Wednesday. It started off as little black and white sketches, more characters. And then um, about six months after that, I got, I'm not a good characterist, 
but I'm a, a pretty good painter. So I end up starting putting a little bit more effort into it. And so every week for almost four years, I posted a painting of a WCW wrestler or something from the history of WCW with the hashtag WCW along with about a two to three paragraph, you know, like I put a lot of work into those, the, the, the thing that you can only see on Instagram because you couldn't see it on Twitter because, you know, they don't let you write these giant things on Twitter. Um, but I go on to write three paragraphs about why Bam Bam Bigelow meant something to me as a kid or, or, you know, two paragraphs on the disco inferno, you know, and, and did you, did you really need two paragraphs on disco inferno? I did. And unfortunately he, he, he only saw the Twitter version, which was cut short. Yeah. So he cut back on me on Twitter, but he, I don't think he ever saw how much I actually wrote about how much I loved him and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this went on for um, almost four years. And now I am, uh, I have over, uh, oh, I don't want to say 200 paintings, but over 150 paintings. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's a bit of a of a, a collection and of a weird kind of niche subject, and so I've decided to put everything together in a one art book, Blood and Paint, that collects all the paintings as well as the, some of the writings, um, and um, it it's a retrospective from a fan's point of view. What uh. I have to self-report here. I'm not only a friend, but I'm also a customer. I did purchase some of your work before. In fact, um, my, my best, one of my best friends graduated from uh, Long Beach uh, State earlier, or I guess last year, wow, time flies. And uh, I bought your photo of Harlem Heat right before Booker T said some regrettable things live on air. And uh, my buddy got a kick about that uh, was very excited to receive that that when he opened it up he is because i got a really nice frame for it too right and he just opened it up thinking like well what what is this what is jay getting me and here it is you know booker t we're coming for you hogan i'm not gonna say the rest of it yeah, yeah, yeah. the the infamous n-word drop yes and uh it was uh much appreciated uh so i, I could attest to the detail that you put into the artwork and obviously um, you're you're painting that by hand, and then you're taking a, a digital copy with your with your. I'm assuming your phone or your camera. And oh, I have a, a giant flatbed scanner. Oh, okay. So you're you're so scanning them directly. On. I I scanned a, like it's not just a, a a photo. It's a it's a high res scan of every painting. Oh wow! And then you also uh, you also did for us our the Viamos Lucha Libre channel the the uh, the uh, thumb not the thumbnail but the the banner for that as yeah. well and uh i was really jazzed with that that one look came out looking really good and i uh, i really appreciated that one that was one of my favorite paintings i ever did like i mean um the i get more compliments on that than than most anything because um i don't know if lucha libre gets as much love as it, it you know should and i was painting some of the the legends and uh that was actually a really fun piece to do. Well, and what what I liked about it is you were so diverse with the with the roster. Like there's La Parca, there's Santo, and then there right there in the middle. Um, oh, why did I forget their name right now? Oh, geez. Well, El Santo's in the middle. Oh, the, y yes, yes. Um, uh, gosh, it's killing me now. Um, now I gotta look it up. <laughs> Hang on, just a second. Uh. Yeah, I'm real professional, Jay. Um, uh, no, uh, there was the Exotico that you put in there, and I cannot think of that person's name at the moment. But that person, uh, I actually got to see wrestle quite a few times uh, live through Championship Wrestling from Hollywood when they were an NWA affiliate. In fact, um, it's on the tip of my tongue, and I just can't think of their name right now. Jeez. Uh, he had a uh, the Prime movie made about him. Yeah. Um, um, if I could, I don't know if you're allowed to show images or what, because I can share the. Yeah. Let's go. Wrong folder. 
If I if I beat you to it, then I'll I'll pull it up on my end. I don't know how to share on this thing. Uh, if you can send it to me in a, a private message, I can pull it up. Oh, that way. yeah, I, I can easily do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I never said I was professional here. Just just so you know. <laughs> Hey, you know, we're all flying by the seat of our pants, man. Um, oh, man, I feel like a, a bum right now. No, I just sent it to you in, in, in the Instagram chat. I see it. Uh, nope, it's not there. Not yet, anyways. Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, let's, as, as I'm trying to pull that up, um, you know, I, I always tell people I love WCW. Um, now, I was a WWF kid growing up because, you know, we live here on the West Coast. The WWF was out here uh, much more frequently uh, than they were on the East Coast. Um, there it is. Now it just came up. Uh, what, what drew me a lot to WCW was the menagerie of talent there was so many um different individuals available in or not available but so many different talents that worked in wcw you would see talents from new japan you'd see talents from mexico um what was it about wcw that was so enticing to you what what made it so such that that you wanted to um embark on this journey well when i was when i was real little because i mean um you know, I, I grew up, there it is, yeah. Um, I grew up mostly as a 90s kid, but, you know, a little bit of the 80s, rock and roll, Hulk Hogan, all that kind of stuff. But to me, pro wrestling was Hulk Hogan, right? So Hulk Hogan goes to WCW, that's where pro wrestling is. Um, I, I, I wasn't young enough to really distinguish different federations or even Lucha Libre and, and, um, at that, at that point in my life. So, I mean, we're talking, uh, uh, you know, was it Legion, not Legion of Doom era WC, uh, WCW. Yeah. Um, at early, you know, 93, 92. So we're talking like Sting, Vader, Ron Simmons, the nasty boys. Yes. Uh, um, mankind, Steve Austin, stunning Steve Austin, stunning Steve Austin with the long blonde hair and the you know, you know him and Brian Pillman, and uh, you know so I was I was watching it from back then, and then um, you know I became a Shawn Michaels fan and started following WWF, but when you know but me and my friends we were always talking about Hulk Hogan, it was always it was always everything went back to Hulk Hogan, Macho Man. Um, you know, my grandfather was a big Ric Flair fan. Um, so your grandfather had great taste. <laughs> he did. He did. The first pay-per-view I think I ever saw was, uh, Bash of the Beach 93. Okay. And Ric Flair comes out with like six girls on each side. I was as a little kid thinking, yes, I want to do that. That is who I want to be. <laughs> that's, that's who, you know, um, and, uh, so just as a fan, I fell in love with WCW. And I know this was not during the Monday Night Wars. This was not the common thing. Most people watched Raw and recorded Nitro. I watched Nitro and recorded Raw. Like I was I was that kid who was all in on I mean when when you know Hogan does the leg drop and, and betrays all that is right and good in the world. Um, and becomes evil. I cried. I was a little kid. I broke my heart. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No. <clears throat> I, I'm a little bit older than you, so like, uh, my memories of Hogan. Obviously, like I was, I can remember sitting there watching WrestleMania too when he beat King Kong Bundy, right? Mm. And uh, going back later and watching WrestleMania one with Mr. T and uh, Superfly Snuka. So all those memories go with me. And, but uh, like, you know, kind of like the highlight, I was in sixth grade. Uh, everyone in my family was rooting for Hulk Hogan. All my friends were rooting for Hulk Hogan. And I was like, no, no, it's all about this ultimate warrior guy. He's the intercontinental champion. 
he's going to win both those belts. So, like, that's my kind of lasting image is Warrior holding both the titles over Hogan. And, you know, and then Hogan would come back and, and like, you know, he would end uh, Yokozuna's brief run uh, initially and then um, before making that jump to WCW. And it was a big deal at the time because, uh, you know, up until that point, you know, Ric Flair was a huge name in the 80s when it came to wrestling. But Hulk Hogan was a sports entertainer and was literally like, you could see him in the movies. You could see him on on late night with uh, you know Jay Leno or hosting. I don't think he hosted Saturday Night Live, but I think he was on episodes of SNL. And it just he he's he in had, Gremlins too. Yeah, he he broke the th- you know he broke the fourth. What was like Deadpool? And yeah. it's like, uh, it's like uh, with a guy like Hogan, it was the first time that WCW signed somebody that was of grand significance. And I'm not trying to dis- discount anybody else who you know went back between WCW and the WWF, but Hogan was the game changer and really set WCW up for its uh, history going forward. So when he made that jump to WCW, like you said, that was that that got you to watch it. But then later, when he joined the NWO and 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 stabbed and stabbed the WCW uh, fan base in the heart, uh, I could get why that would. Uh, make you burst into tears i know he's kind of regarded as somewhat of a controversial figure but eric bischoff yeah okay and the numbers don't lie when eric bischoff took over wcw wcw was a company that lost 10 million dollars every year that's what they did that's what they did this is before the hogan signing after hogan after (laughs) National, it became a company that was making 36 million a year, yeah, right. Like, I mean, yes, I his people skills were probably not what it should have been as a manager. He was also very young, yeah, you know, in that position. I mean, there's the story of him throwing coffee at Eddie Guerrero. Um, you know, he 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 was under immense pressure. Um, and it's sad to hear some of the, the backstage stuff. But at the same time, just on if you just look at what he did on paper, he took something that was failing and made it incredibly successful. Well, you know, as I was writing up the the um, uh, press release for the show today, it's it's one of those things where like you got to think about it. Before there was WCW, um, a lot of people again attribute Jim Crockett promotions, which became WCW as the NWA. So there was that natural migration for NWA fans to go directly to WCW because at that point, uh, Jim Crockett was such a big NWA member that when they became WCW, people just thought the whole thing, the NWA was WCW, right? And they had so, Yeah. And I mean, AWA was at that point was already gone. Um, there was we hadn't seen the the revolution of ECW yet. Uh, and new Japan was still in Japan and, you know, wrestling in Mexico was still in Mexico. So it's like, that was the first time that you had two perennial powerhouses of wrestling companies. Now, WWE has never taken a step back in and back when, you know, Vince was running it and, and kind of took over all the territories. Uh, he made sure that his business was leveraged for success uh, Jim Crockett tried to keep up with Vince, but never could. Never had that same kind of cash. You had Ted Turner come in, and and and, and basically, you had an open check to sign whoever they could to get the right people involved. The problem with with WCW though is that you know Vince McMahon, uh, although not ever traditionally trained as a pro wrestler per se, grew up in the industry where Eric Bischoff did not have that same luxury. Was not from wrestling. He got into well, wrestling. But he wasn't from wrestling. Even before Eric Bischoff, it was mismanaged because Ted, you know, I forget the gentleman's name, but there was the an executive who was in charge of uh, Papa John's. And then he was put in charge of WCW because he had, he had made Papa John's successful. So they put pizza executives in, in charge of WCW. They put different, you know, like it was a revolving door. And there's a great book called Nitro that goes into the the history of all this. Um, And, you know, uh, Jim Cornette talked about 
the Papa John's guy, and his big contribution to pro wrestling was um, the Ding Dongs. Oh, wow. Like, are you familiar with the Ding Dongs? Yeah, that goes back to the Jim, yeah, the Jim Crockett promotion. Jim there. Crockett, yeah, just, you know, was W, because he was that era with WCW. Um, uh, the Ding Dongs was the one thing when, because, over four years, I started reading the book, reading history books. I started, I've seen all the WWE documentaries a dozen times. Um, but the Ding Dongs was the one piece, piece of history that I kind of fell in love with because of how stupid <laughs> it is. And uh, I've painted the Ding Dongs a couple of times <laughs> over the years because of uh, just how insane. Uh, that was, let me see if I can't, you know, like amazing, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's wrestling at its most stupid, um, from Belleville, Mississippi or wherever they were from, you know, and they would ring the bells. Uh, but it, it was stuff like that, that you know, going back through the history of WCW made me fall in love with it even more as a fan today. Um, so, you, you know, some... go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so you had said earlier when we just started about uh, Bam Bam Bigelow and what his significance to WCW was, was that your guy was Bam Bam, your dude or who like besides Hogan, who else were you rooting for? Who else were you checking out? What was your a big Vader your fan? I was a big Vader fan. My guy. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, I was always a heavier kid. Those sure. are big guys. And to see Vader hit a moonsault, to see Vader do some of the stuff that he did, um, I, I, I know people will say he was a little rough or whatever, but that was, he came, that Japanese hard style, um, other than Mick Foley, I can't think of anybody who he actually ever hurt in the ring. You know, well, that wasn't um, even his fault. It was, like, it was the, the ropes. ropes. Right. Yeah. Um. So, like, you know, I I absolutely love Vader. He was also on Boy Meets World. <laughs> yeah. Back in the day. Yep. As the bully's father. Um. You know, so it was. Again, when you're younger and you see some of these characters, you mentioned King Kong Bundy. He was on a Married with Children a couple right. of times. Um, his his wrestling, his wrestler was the inspiration for the for the family's name. The, the the guys that created Married with Children were big wrestling fans, and that's why they had Bundy as the last name. Which I don't know if a lot of people know that. And also, the neighbors were named Rhodes after Dusty Rhodes. Yep. You know. Yep. Um, the '90s television man. It's all just I, that's what I grew up on. Uh, getting getting back to Vader, where you did so I'm a huge Vader guy too, and you know part of the reason why I liked Vader is because he he was born in Linwood, California. You know that's I was born in Linwood, California. He uh he played football for the Rams for a brief time, uh, but besides that, at one point in his career. He held the world title equivalent belt in Japan and in Mexico and the United States. Later, he would hold the world title equivalent in Japan, uh, in uh, Germany, and in the U.S. So, like, he was not only the world champion, but, like, he was the world's champion. He held multiple world titles uh, at one point, you know, uh, holding the UWA title from Mexico, holding the IWGP Heavyweight Championship in, in New Japan and holding the uh, the Catch Wrestling Alliance title in Germany. Also, you know, later holding the WCW World Championship. So that dude to me is like uh, tops. Of course, he had his uh, shoot fighting career too. I mean, his battles with Stan Hansen where Stan Hansen literally knocked his eye out during a match and, and Vader popped it back in. I mean, that dude was as tough as nails. And uh, he's a guy that I always wish that WWF would have done something more with because he's such a great wrestler, such such an anomaly, like you said, doing moonsaults and, and, and backflips in the ring, stuff that most guys that size could not do, and he did it with the greatest of ease. 
I mean, yeah, the the mammoth. I mean, that, even when they finally inducted him in the Hall of Fame and they used the the name the mammoth, I was like, oh, really? Is 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 just a way? That's a waste. I mean, that the weird, creepy when he was in Japan, that helmet oh, yeah. thing. Oh yeah. You know the smoke and the. Um, I actually just sent you in the chat a couple of Vader paintings I did. We're gonna we'll, we'll get those up too. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, Vader, man. I'm telling you, he's uh, he's a pretty good, dude. Uh, you sent those in uh, Instagram. Yeah. Okay. And so you said Vader, and and who else? Uh, who else was your guy in WCW, or was that it? Um, well, no, I mean. Um... Cactus Jack. Jack. I'm sorry. You said yeah, Jack. Mick Foley. Uh, Cactus Jack. Yeah, Mick Foley. Um, he was one of those guys who like I fell in love with more during the Mankind era. Sure. Um, you know, uh, but going back and, and watching his Cactus Jack stuff, um, again, one of the things I absolutely the, some of the paintings I did were just for me. Right. Like here's my uh, I did a Cactus Jack versus Arachnaman. That's amazing. Arachnaman. You know, did you watch Into the Spider Verse just to go off subject here a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge. I'm more of a comic book guy than anything. I know, I I know that about you, but I swear, I swear, when all those Spider Man were together, that I saw Arachna Man, and 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 I I haven't gone back and watched the movie since, but I was in the theater. And I go, Purple Yellow. That's the Arachna Man. That's that's that, that dude's in Bad Street. Let's go. It, it, uh, the Purple and Yellow Spider Man. This is so nerdy. Um, was not um, Arachnaman. It was uh, uh, Bullet Point Spider-Man from a mini series um, where that Spider-Man is actually Bruce Banner. What? Uh, they did a series um, years ago called Bullet Points, and it's it's a five issue mini series where um, uh, the guy who created Captain America's serum. Yeah, he is shot twenty four hours earlier, so Captain America is never created, and it's a Marvel universe without Captain America, and it's all about the ripple effects. My Vader versus Sting, and then of course Vader versus Cactus Jack. Yeah, really cool. And um, in that universe, they do the Gamma experiment, and Bruce Banner while looking over the uh, the Arizona field, is bitten by an, a radioactive spider from his gamma experiment, and it uh, really messes him up. He's much more of a um, spider, a man-spider creature under there than, you know, but the, the purple and yellow is, is the bullet point Spider-Man. Okay. Well, in my mind, it was it was it was a <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, let's go." Mm. Uh, well, that's that's unfortunate, but thanks for the uh, thanks for the information there. Because I saw it, I'm like, I've never seen. I I I used to be a very avid comic book follower. I used to check out, uh, you know, like I I liked. Um, I kind of liked some of the. I was an X Men guy. Like I liked X Men, X Force, X Factor, all that. Now's stuff. a good time to be an X Men fan. Yeah, in the 90s for sure. I also jumped on to stuff that was a little bit more obscure. So like the Thor core and the Green Lantern core, I just thought those were really cool. And then like not Iron Man, but War Machine. Like I'm like, yeah, let's go, man. This is cool. So like uh, and then like this whole Spider-Man 2099. That's I mean, that came out when right in the middle of when I was collecting comics. So I jumped in on that. But I, I did not know of the lore of uh of the Bruce Banner Spider-Man. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that, but uh, yeah, I was, I was kind of like, just like, uh, like I said, I thought that was <laughs> the Ragnar Mad Paint homage. That's the, pro wrestler. the bullet points was a really fun series um, because it's a, it's a what if universe where it's all about the ripple effect because this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, you know, um, yeah. but uh, I, 2099 is, is, I grew up collecting all the 2099 books. Ghost Rider 2099 was one of my favorites. Um, and then they had the World of 2099, which came out quarterly. 
and that was like a thicker book and you get a couple of short stories of like different things going on in the 2099 universe um but yeah comics was was uh wrestling was kind of my first love and then um comics was always my second love and then uh I originally I wanted to be a pro wrestler and then I got hurt. Um, and that dream kind of fell to the wayside. Yeah. And, uh, so then I went all in on, uh, on comic books and sequential art and, you know, that kind of thing. So bringing it back to, to wrestling. And I do want to talk about, uh, more, more of your projects, more than just blood and paint, but uh, getting back yeah. to wrestling because um, that's so, what we're here. We're, it's it's, it's yeah. a wrestling podcast, but comics are cool too. And as anyone who's watching this knows, we tend to we tend to fall off topic quite a bit, uh, oh, yeah. especially when it comes to like MCU and comics. You know, that's that's fun stuff. And and similarly, like I did fall in love with wrestling and comic books right about the same time. To be quite honest, and. And I felt like most of my teenage years, if I wasn't uh, playing a sport in high school or, or chasing girls on the weekend, I was watching wrestling or or buying comics or or even you know watching cartoons. And and there's such you know so many parallels between them. You know, you have the good guys and the bad guys, and and especially during like WCW up until maybe the NWO, it was very clearly defined roles as who was good and who was bad. So when Hogan came in, they had the big parade and, you know, Sting was there. And, and then, you know, when we, I remember uh, there was episodes of Nitro when Lex Luger came back to WCW and he came back as a heel, but then he would team with Sting, who was like the uber baby face. And then you would have when they wrestled together as he'd come down the aisle with Sting and, you know, Sting was celebrated and fans were giving him high fives and Luger would give high fives. And then as soon as Sting turns around, Luger would just stop touching the fans and, and just narrow his focus down to the ring. And then when Sting would turn around, he'd, he'd be back into being a baby face again. It was a, a, a lot of fun. Uh, but like, of course that whole NWO moment really kind of ratified how wrestling was treated in that well-defined good guy versus bad guy kind of became this very much gray area. And then we'd see that roll out into, of course, ECW. Uh, there was a lot of gray in ECW. You didn't really know who the good guys or the there bad weren't guys. Any good guys in ECW. I loved ECW. No one was good in ECW. There was no, there was no Gallahan in ECW. There was no one. The Maybe. closest you Maybe get is Tommy Maybe. Dreamer. Yeah, That's but Tommy it. Dreamer is not a, a Galahad like character. He, Tommy <laughs> Dreamer is the voice of the fan in ECW. That's fair, right? Like you yeah. want to see this, I'm going to give you this. Um, and he represented the fans. Everybody saw themselves in ECW as Tommy Dreamer because Tommy Dreamer was the underdog. He was the guy you could root for. But there was no classically like straight hero figure in ECW. Yeah. And, and like anytime there was somebody who was close, like a Tommy dreamer or like a, a Mikey Whipwreck, you know, things would happen. And of course that would all change anyways. You know, they would have a guy like RVD who the fans would root for, but to be honest, he didn't wrestle like a baby face. And you had a, a guy who was, you know, proclaimed to be carrying the company on his back like Shane Douglas, but then or Taz even, but then you know again didn't wrestle like the traditional baby face. And I mean, they would even fall in love with guys like Terry Funk or you know Mick Foley or even like a like a Sabu. But again, none of those guys acted or wrestled like a baby face. So a lot of great uh, area in in ECW. Then of course in WWF, the whole attitude era. And that bled over into WCW because yeah. a lot of W, you know, you forget a lot of those guys went to Sandman was hardcore hack. That's right. Um, Raven, of course, took his whole flock. Um, Perry Saturn yep. had, had an amazing run in WCW. But even before those guys, I mean, you go back to uh, in the mid 90s when they brought in, you know, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero. Juventud Guerrera, Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit, 
Too cold. Well, the Too Cold Scorpio was actually the opposite. He kind of he left WCW to be in ECW, but you, you they brought in all this very good talent, um, you know, both from ECW and from Lucha Libre AAA. They they built their whole cruiserweight division around those guys. Chris Jericho also in that group, and then later, you, like you said, Lance Storm, um, Mike Awesome. <laughs> the, the wheel just kept spinning and anytime a new talent came into ECW got over and became big it seemed like there was a direct route to WCW WCW or WWE yeah um, yeah you know which we now know Paul Heyman you know had more of a, a working relationship with WWE um but like yeah WCW you know, they were they were clearly watching ECW, and when somebody something would work in WCW, it, would, it was you know, you mentioned Mikey Whipwreck, he wrestled in WCW. Yeah, Sabu, my one of my favorite paintings I did um, was uh, Sabu versus Alex Wright. I which, don't remember that match at all. Why did it, that it, one stick out to you? Um. Well, because it was one of those things where um, somebody had reached out to me and asked me to, because I also would do direct commissions. Yes. Right? So there was a couple of paintings I did of like Jake the Snake or somebody would reach out and somebody wanted a, a painting of Sabu. And I thought, well, maybe I can kill two birds with one stone and and do something from his time in WCW. And so I there's a moment where he's wrestling Alex Wright and he does a hurricane Rana over the top rope and he throws Alex Wright to the floor. But it was this painting I did that I absolutely loved because I, I got to show Sabu's diaphragm completely stretched out. It almost looked like a, a Renaissance painting of the way I, I really got to actually just work on his anatomy and it was less about, um, you know, what it, it 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 became less about showcasing Sabu, and more about, um, you know, like th this guy's anatomy and the scars and and uh, that kind of thing. Got to really get give it some detail too. Yeah, it was it, it was one of my favorite paintings that I ever did. I'm going to send you a link in the chat. It's a, a gallery of all the WCW paintings. You know, I think I have that right here, actually. I think I'm looking at that right now, so I will put it here. It's also, uh, I, I think it's in the link in the video description, but if anyone mm. is interested in checking it out, um, absolutely you can. Uh I, I actually have two of them that uh, I really enjoy looking at. I was looking at them earlier today. And I think I told you about the first one a while ago, but uh, this one right here with Ric Flair oh. and Dusty, uh, obviously being a diehard NWA fan, that one uh, resonates with me very much uh, as Flair was always uh, in contention with Dusty for the 10 pounds of gold. And you got and, a little bit of blood splatter coming off of Flair's face. and Right. Um the hardest thing to paint is probably the hardest thing to match color wise is probably Flair's hair color. Yeah, yeah. Because it's this white, it's this like super bright blonde, fried blonde hair, and getting the paint to try to match that color is as a painter, that is was one of the hardest things to try to match Flair's Flair's hair. Now, the other one, being a sucker for the NWA that I am, there was one point in time where there was a championship, a collection of titles that was represented as the J-Cup that was made famous in New Japan Pro Wrestling, but got some run in WCW when Ultimo Dragon uh, would debut for the company under the guidance of Sonny Ono. And for those of you who are familiar with Ultimo Dragon, he had uh, won a tournament where they unified eight junior heavyweight titles. And in that bunch, not only on WCW television did they have, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, 
the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. They also had the WWF Light Heavyweight Championship. And as uh, part of that eight was the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship. And that's always my favorite little uh, uh, tidbit of history. Like in 96, when the w, when the NWA was at its probably least relevant uh, point in time, they had connections with promotions in Japan where they had uh, created this title and the title was exclusive in Japan. They took the, there was a, a world junior heavyweight championship in the States and they retconned it to Japan. And that title ended up that lineage of the J, J crown is connected to the world junior heavyweight title. That's in the NWA today. That's currently held by uh, uh, Colby Carino. So it's kind of cool to see that, that lineage, that title that had so much meaning going back into the to yesteryear, like uh, guys who I grew up watching, like Laser Man, Laser Tag Lou, and and uh, Nelson Royal, and even guys like uh, 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 Danny Hodge. Dan, yes, Danny Hodge, and having them see that junior heavyweight title. Uh, you know, obviously it wasn't the same physical belt, but that lineage, that that history was still there. And to see that on WCW Nitro was just like the coolest thing. And looking back at that, it's it's still one of my favorite things. And so when you uh, you capture that artwork, I always thought that that was just such an incredible, incredible shot. Uh, because, again, it was representing those eight crowns. And when those eight titles, uh, you know, at one point, those eight titles were unioned. Uh, Union, uh, United, uh, United. Thank you. I don't know why I can't speak anymore. United with the WCW Cruiserweight title to make nine belts, and then uh, you know, WWF seeing the success of what WCW is doing, introduced its own, uh, you know, light heavyweight division. So they broke up the J Crown, and it was only the two belts: the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Title, and of course the WCW Cruiserweight Title. And the NWA would finally get their title back too, but uh, it, it just a uh, a weird time in 1996 uh, that the W that the WCW featured an NWA title, and then in '98 uh, uh, WWF would showcase uh, the NWA World Tag Team Titles, the NWA North American Championship, and then would even he didn't defend the title, but uh, Dan Severn would come out with the 10 pounds of gold on Raw. So it was just uh, as an NWA mark, that was always kind of a cool piece of time to look back at, and uh, that's why I like that painting. Baltimore Dragon was one of those guys I absolutely loved as a kid. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he he had this martial arts style, but also like he could fly around. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone like, you know, not tap with the Dragon Sleeper. Um, I think it's still a good finisher. I wish somebody would be using it today. Um, you know, it's his stuff was always so solid. And when he came out with all those belts, like as a kid, your, your imagination goes wild. Like, Oh, he's competing on the weekends. He's over, he's flying over to another country. He's, he's winning other people's belts. You know, how bad is this guy that he's got other companies titles? I mean, the way to look at it is it was instant credibility. When he stepped off that set, when he stepped into that ring, and him and Sonny Ono were the first guy I ever saw take a selfie, Sonny Ono, and they had all those title belts. Like, you knew that this dude was legit. So when mm -hmm. he stepped into the ring with Dean Malenko or Rey Mysterio or Eddie Guerrero, whoever it was, like, you were going to see a good match. And, uh, you know, one of the best matches I've ever seen. I loved uh, – I love Lucha Libre, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. I love the – I always often tell people my favorite uh, time in WCW was that cruiserweight division in like in 1997, 1996, that era where you had guys like Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Rey Mysterio, and Juventud Guerrera, Psicosis, uh, Chris that Jericho. cruiserweight division was amazing. It was so fire. And, and again, wow. it had – such you know we look at Rey Mysterio today and he's probably considered the most absolute famous luchador of all time but you know he doesn't get there if he doesn't spend some time in WCW you know you know they screwed his career a little bit up but uh you know they, that ship got righted towards the end here's the thing about WCW and if you the booking 
everybody got screwed over. Um, <laughs> and the, the problem is like when I'm, I'm writing this retrospective and everybody who can say anything negative about what happened has already said it. Yep. So I am trying to just be like, wasn't that cool? Yes, of course, of course. Like, you know, yes, it could have been better. Yes, different, you know, they never should have taken the mask off, off of Ray. Um, you know, but look at what we did get. And, you know, you just got to be happy with what you, sometimes you just got to be content. You got to understand you're talking, you're preaching to the choir over here. We, we're mostly NWA fans. And it's never as perfect or beautiful as the way I want it, but I still have this affinity for the brand. See, oh, like part of the, the part of the um, no, um, uh, Alex Wright when he turned heel. Oh yeah, Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. I will. The one thing that I will never forgive WCW for is when he turned heel. He should have been renamed to Alex Wrong. That's the one thing, like Berlin, really? No. <laughs> like, that's the one thing. But part of the Kickstarter is I did a bunch of these sketch cards. So, you know, I did a whole set of the cruiserweight division. Again, my man, Ultimo Dragon. Yeah. La Parca. You know, I, I, I had a, a huge love for Ultimo Dragon. So, so Ultimo Dragon, Vader, uh, Mick F or Cactus Jack. It seems like you liked guys that had spent some time in Japan before coming to WCW. Well, you know that that style is a little rougher. Sure. Um, and again, I, I say it in the book. I was a naive child. I believed it. Yeah, I absolutely one hundred percent believed it was real. Um, the only time I started to question it was the undertaker when he's throwing lightning bolts around the arena. I'm like, there's some pre-production involved in that. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that was the, the one time as a kid, I was like, mm, something's off, but like, I believed it. I, I absolutely believed it for a very long time, longer than I, I should have. Um, so, but coming from, that perspective, I like the guys that looked realer. That that you know, you know that it it did resonate as more of a fight or an actual wrestling match. Um, so let's, let's let's. I'm sorry. Let's finish your thought and then let's talk about the Kickstarter. All right. The other guy who I absolutely loved um, was DDP. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I I was dyslexic. They publicly set out on television. He was dyslexic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and when you're dyslexic and you're dealing with all that, you know, stuff, they tell you all these people who were dyslexic and it's like, oh, Albert Einstein or, oh, the, this Nobel Prize. Or, DDP. DDP was somebody who I related to and somebody who inspired me, you know, as, as a dyslexic kid. It's like, you're telling me the world heavyweight champion was dyslexic. Now we're talking. <laughs> Give me somebody I can relate to because you know Einstein. I'm not Einstein, but I could have been DDP. Yes. And, uh, and uh, the thing about Diamond Dallas Page, and, and I have this core memory. I was a huge DDP guy when he when he broke away from being a manager to turn into the wrestler. I remember just enjoying the heck out of his run. And especially that world title run where, where you know the NWA was actively courting him, and mm -hmm. uh, that scene where uh, you know Scott hands him the shirt and Paul and and Scott are celebrating, and then DDP throws the shirt down and gives them both diamond cutters. I mean, his run was pretty wild, and 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 he, you know, it's I, I feel too old to be saying this now, but he was an old guy at thirty six, thirty seven, and that and he uh, he broke into the business, became world champion at fifty. And uh, he really kind of uh, he he really did good business for WCW, and I I remember being at the you know I went to two WCW events uh, before the whole thing shut down, and one of them was in San Diego, California, at the Cox Arena, and that night I got to see DDP wrestle, 
And uh, I got to see Raven and the flock come down one side. And then I got to see Sting uh, come down to confront the NWO on the other side. I got to see uh, Goldberg before he was on his, you know, win streak. And it was such a cool experience. But that, that reaction that DDP got was so intense, so intense. And that was before he was even in the world title picture. And he was, I, he was again, the everyman. He was so loved. And, you know, he'd come through the, the, the crowd and, you know, self high five, you know, everybody just loved DDP. And, and he, you know, even when he was later on in WCW, when he was the bad DDP, I think the fans had a hard time booing him. Yeah, it was hard. Uh, he came out as the triad with him and Canyon and uh, Bam Bam. And they were still, yeah. they were still fun. I still wanted to watch those guys. Yeah. Like it was it, those, they tried so hard to make them heels that it, it didn't work. It just, you know, it's like Rob Van Dam. You can't make him a bad guy. People love him too much. The lovable stoner, man. Like you can't, he, he, he they can't turn him heel. It just doesn't work. So let's, no. let's, let's talk about the Kickstarter because obviously the campaign, um, when, like I, you said, you said you've been working on this for roughly, uh, four years the paintings and uh yeah. getting this this book into into work but like when did this go live when did you decide to start the uh, actual the, kickstarter the actual campaign went live a couple hours ago nice so i mean we are live right now um uh i i i'm doing my very best not to just keep clicking refresh uh <laughs> This is my eighth Kickstarter campaign. Um, uh, I, I have a 50-50% success rate with Kickstarters. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've always done as a member of all my Kickstarters, even the ones that, that failed, everybody who backed it got a free PDF of the book. Wow, that's really cool. Because you supported me, you showed up, you put money on the table. That means the world to me. And so even though we didn't reach the goal, I still wanted to show my respect and show thank, the thank you for coming out. Um, this Kickstarter, um, because the book is, it's a coffee table art book. It's a 200 page coffee table art book. Um, it's the most expensive book I've ever produced. Most of my books come in at ten to fifteen dollars. Um, this is an eighty dollar art book, um, so it is it is the most expensive thing I've ever produced. The quality is the most you know the best quality I could I could do, you know get a yeah, hardback, um, and um, so again we the. We're asking for five thousand, which again in the world of Kickstarter is not that much. Um, but it, it it it's what I, I I need to actually get the book processed and shipped to everyone. You know, because I, I run pretty thin Kickstarter margins. And I'm just right now I'm kind of looking over uh, some of the incentives and everything else, like. Uh, you have uh, a very a lot of rewards for those who um, who uh, donate to the project. I mean, uh, there's many categories. Of course, there's, uh, as I'm looking there's right now, you have the United States Championship, the Cruiserweight Championship. Uh, a Cruiserweight Championship with your donation of $10 gets you a digital copy of the book and uh yeah, you could also yeah, and then like the United States Championship gives you uh, a digital copy of the book and then a bookmark set, and then you can add on other options too, like a sketch card or um, additional bookmark sets or a hand painted postcard, um, uh, you know, eleven by seventeen poster, uh, and all the prices are right there. So if you want to, you know, go all in, if you will, um, there's options for you. Then with each, you know, each different. Uh, uh, reward there's there's higher uh incentives like uh if you do the intercontinental championship there's a 40 dollar pledge you receive four items if you do the television championship pledge you get uh, for 50 dollars you get five items 
you do the cruiserweight championship, you get uh, eight items, and that one's a hundred dollars. And then the hardcore includes ten items, which is uh, two hundred dollars. Uh, the women's championship is three hundred dollars and includes eleven items. And there's uh, it, it, it keeps going, and everything in there is like you, you're getting so much for your donation. It's not just you know here's a hot dog and a handshake. Good luck, little fella. Like you're really rewarding your guys who are uh, donating to it. You know, again, like the, the bookmarks, I've always done the bookmarks. I'm a big fan of bookmarks. The, this one I'm very proud of because it's a set of four, and one side's a WCW, the other side's an NWO. That's really cool. You know, or like you get on this side is NWO Macho Man and then DDP. Let's try and get yeah. the glare. Um, so, like, the, the sketch cards, again, are original – sketch as well as because i thought the trading cards would be fun I, on the back of the sketch cards it's printed to look like an old wcw um you know trading card from the 90s yeah yeah okay yeah i see it so one side's the, your 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 classic trading card and the other side's a an original sketch um also if you do something like one of the older like the the sketch cards or something that um can fit in an envelope like you're gonna get an envelope uh, this is something i stole from wizard magazine back in the day <laughs> nice um like uh envelope that one side has an original sketch on it that's really cool so like that's for some of the 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 you know tiers that aren't so you know so packed with the book and stuff because again unfortunately the book itself retails for 80 so a lot of the 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 smaller tiers i'm i'm trying to give you as much as i can you know for a the support and b you know i i want you to walk away with something i want you to you know if you you know i like you know, uh, also we did um, hand painted postcards. So I was trying to, uh, like, hey, here's a blank sketch card. So it's just got the. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, like we did a bunch of like here's a, a painting of Scott Norton. That's oh. a postcard. You know, Kimberly uh, Page. Buff Bagwell. You know, Raven versus DDP. So those are actually postcards that you know you can get mailed out to you, and you get you get a um, an original uh, painting. You know, because that's that's uh, watercolor and ink. And then, uh, when does the project? Uh... How how long do they have to? Uh, uh, April thirtieth is the last day, so, so it's basically the whole month of April. Right. You know? And then, so, and I I don't mean to sound like negative, but like, if you don't reach your goal of five thousand, what do you do? Do you do you just stop, or do you try to go again, or or how does that work? If if I don't reach the goal, um. I have um, another route that we'll 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 pursue, but the quality of the book's not going to be necessarily as it's not going to be necessarily what I believe the, this project deserves. Well, we're gonna make sure to put uh, this this video this this link all the information. We'll put that on the Alliance Wrestling dot com website. Plus, this uh, video will be on our YouTube page as well as on our podcasting uh, station so that other people can, if they hear it, they'll have the opportunity to, to find those links to get invested, to get in on this project. Because again, it's not just about, uh, you know, Brandon making a book. It's also about showcasing the love and admiration for WCW and kind of reclaiming those three initials that uh, have seemingly gone by the wayside in, in recent days, recent years, and uh, kind of bring back uh, those good good feelings that WCW brought to many of us throughout the eighties and nineties. And here's the thing. Like I said, there's 150 paintings, right? Well, this one's a CM Punk. 
Um, but like you donate to the Kickstarter at a, a certain rate, you're gonna get an original painting. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, like I have a lot of these paintings, and uh, I know you've you've bought a few from me over the years. Um and it's it's uh most people are gonna walk away with some original art. Right? Like that's the, the thing. Like here's my uh, oh yeah, I love that that piece I did for you, the, the AWA belt. NWA. The NWA belt, yeah. Um, I was looking for this because I this was hanging up earlier, but it must have fallen down. But I have the Harley Race and Ric Flair in the steel cage. Mm -hmm. That one was uh, one of my favorites. I had that. That was sitting up here, but I guess it fell down earlier. That flare for the gold, baby, right there. Yeah. Um, you know, finger point, finger poke of doom. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, the Nash power bomb. Oh, that. That was such a scary power bomb because no one had taken Big Show off his feet like that. I well, mean, unfortunately, at that point, everybody it was a test of like, oh, if Goldberg can get Big Show up, yeah. I can get Big Show up. And no, no, you <laughs> can't. You know, oh, you know, people were doing stuff with Big Show that they really shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. You know. Well, let's I, let's change gears just a little bit because uh, one last NWO. Oh yeah, and you know I know I know a lot of you guys out there go to the autograph signings. You go to Frank and Sons when they have talent there, or you know uh, uh, here locally the wrestling shop, not locally but in Southern California, and and you know these are perfect things to get signed by some of the legends at the you know these are things that they would never see. That's see that's. That's awesome. That's Knobs and uh, 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 Norman Smiley. Yes, Big Willie. The big back smile. at the uh, the end of the uh, WCW Hardcore Division. Do you have any Ming ones? Uh, there's uh, I'm not finished. I have two Mings that are um, the him getting hit with the pepper spray by uh, Miss Elizabeth. Yeah, and then I have uh, one of him choking out. Uh, the cat that is uh, <laughs> um, yeah. in the middle of uh, of, of production. Nice. Because again, like I said off off there, there's a few more paintings that I want to get done. Um, mostly because I feel like I'm, WCW was around for a long time, and there are some people that are just not going to be in the book. Yeah. But there are some people that I feel like I need to at least acknowledge their contributions in some of the events. Like I still have to paint Medusa throwing away the women's championship. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's some big events that I still need to hit just to cover the what I feel of the history of the company. Yeah. Well, that's that. I mean, this is I'm excited for you. I think this is a great idea. I I uh, I'm definitely going to be purchasing one of the books when it comes out, and I will be getting on that uh, contribution board uh, probably next payday. Uh, but I'm I'm excited for you. I think this is uh, you could tell that you have passion behind this. This isn't something you're just doing just to make a buck. You this is something you believe in and that you care about. And I think that's really cool. There's not enough wrestling fans like that these days. I feel like a lot of times people are just in it to make money, um, which is I mean, it takes everybody, right? But I think it's it's cool that what you're doing and and, and I kind of pull myself into the same equation like. Guys like you, guys like me, we're talking about the history of this business because it's something that we grew up with. It's something that we care about. It's something that still means something to us. And, uh, you know, if it's not for people like you and people like me to keep promoting uh, not just what's happening today, but what happened in the past. I mean, the old adage is if you forget the past, you're doomed to repeat it. But, uh, you know, if nobody talks about it, then it never happened. So I, I, I applaud your efforts into trying to keep that history alive and again the more obscure stuff the better because uh you know not not everything is going to be on that wwe network slash peacock deal you're not going to be able to see everything forever and it's going to be 
there, there are some things on there that I'd love to watch that aren't even on that. Yeah. The old the WCW Saturday Night Light does. They don't have all the seasons. They don't have, you know, back when it was the the studio set. Yeah. You know, and there's they, there was good matches. The, the the sad part about WCW is they always had a stacked roster. They always had, in my opinion, the better in ring wrestling. Yes, for sure. I, I don't think that's even up for debate. I feel like, uh, again, when you look at what WCW had, um, you know, going in from the early 90s, like, you know, they had guys like Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes and, and Sting. and The natural and, Dustin Rhodes. Yeah, and Lex Luger. And, you know, these guys, I mean, a lot of them came from the NWA, sure. But then, like, the guys that they continue to bring in, the Two Cold Scorpio. Two Cold Scorpio was doing shit nobody was doing. Uh, stuff he was doing aren't... stuff that people aren't doing today. Yes, exactly. And he right, was a doing 450 that. leg drop. Amazing. You know, he defied gravity. I don't know. He turned it off. I don't know how he did the things that he did. And he wasn't a small. He wasn't a junior heavyweight by any stretch. He was a big guy. Yeah, you know, he, he was. Joe 220, you know, he wasn't a little, he wasn't like a, you know, with no, no disrespect intended to some of the cruiserweights we see or junior heavyweights we see nowadays, but you know, he was over 200 pounds, over 220 doing moves like that. Not, not, you know, 165 pounds soaking wet, being able to do flips and dips and everything else. He was a guy who was built like a man doing uncanny things. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Destiny Comics because obviously, you know, wrestling is part of your love and passion, but it's not the only thing that you do. Let's talk a little bit about Destiny Comics uh, before I let you go. Okay. uh, If people want to check out what you're doing uh, with Destiny Comics, it's just the www.destinycomics. Let me, I'm going to send you a link to my store. I store. I think I'm on it right now, the Weebly. Weebly, yeah. Yeah, I'll put the link right here also in the chat and it'll put it up here on the screen. Destiny Comics with an X dot Weebly dot com. Yes. And you have a variety of characters and uh flat foot McGee, uh eight pulp pit or eight bit pulp, excuse me, uh terrifying gruesome tales of horror, <laughs> Mr. Cuddles, novels and funnies. Uh where do these uh, inspirations come from? Uh, Flat, but Flat Foot McGee, you've told me a little bit about in the past how he's kind of a, a detective, like a, a noir type detective. Tell me he about is, this. Flat Foot McGee is born out of my love for classic animation. Okay. The graphic novel is 108 pages, hand painted. Everything's watercolor and ink. Um, took me about three years. To, to do the, the first graphic novel. Um, he is a duck detective in a, a Looney Tunes inspired universe. Okay. So like the, the first issue, the first big story, first big case in the graphic novel is um, I, I did an homage to the death of George Reeves where, um, you know, basically this mighty mouse esque figure um is uh, murdered and uh, people have hired him to figure out whether or not it was suicide or whether it was a murder. Okay. And, um, you know, he, it deals with a lot of that old, you know, cause in this world, yes, cartoons are real, but they're also like, they're the studio, the, the cartoons are actors in these, these things. And so I get to, you know, there's uh, Flatfoot McGee is again a love letter to like the 1930s. It's um, Dick Tracy. It's um, you know dames and dolls and <laughs> and cartoons and cartoon physics and with a little bit of that noir edge to it because there there are a few characters who unfortunately don't see it all the way to the end of the book. <laughs> So you have a little bit of realism in there. Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, I, I started working on, like, because uh, the first Flatfoot short came out in 09. I did a book called Tales of Destiny Comics, which basically had the first short Mr. Cuddles, first short Mr. Uh, Flatfoot McGee, and a few other things. Um, but, uh, uh, again, Flatfoot McGee is, you know, I'm wearing the shirt right now. Uh probably the thing I'm the most proudest of because it's, it's also the most, um, it, it's the book that I want to just keep drawing for the rest of my life. So are you still currently working on that book as well? Yes. Um, I'm working on, um, I don't know when it, when it's going to come out because I have my publishing schedule for this year planned out. Mm -hmm. So the next flat foot will probably be next year. Um, so it's, it's, um, again, with indie comics, I could do the issue by issue by issue, but I think for me personally, just having the graphic novel on my table works best. So I'll wait till I have another hundred pages of flat foot before I, I, I publish again. Um, terrifyingly gruesome tales of horror is my yearly Halloween horror anthology. So it's a black and white book that comes out every October. It's just a series of short stories. They don't continue on to the next one. Um, the just reason like why, just one of the reason why it's called that is um, there's something in the 1940s, maybe, yeah, 1940, 45. Um, no, probably later, 48 called the Comics Code Authority. Congress got involved with the comics. They laid down these rules that every comic book had to abide by. Yes. And part of the rules were you could never publish a book that had horror, terror, gruesome um, in the cover. So terrifyingly gruesome tales of horror is, you know, that's my old man joke. That is, these are all the words that were banned at one point <laughs> and um, I'm doing a book that has all the band words in it. So each, you know, we, we do one every year. Um, typically we do a photo shoot with a model for the cover. So the covers are photo and, you know, like uh, one issue has a sexy witch. Uh, the, the next issue uh, we did a sexy ghost. Um, and then we did like a sexy zombie. <laughs> there's a you theme, know, there's a recurring there, theme here. There's a theme to the covers. Um, and uh, we used to do more photo shoots with the 8-bit pulp stuff. Yeah. But they, basically now we just do the one pinup photo shoot for the cover. And I only do one shoot a year. And it's, you know, the, the sexy horror theme. Um, that's, that's interesting, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's fun comic stuff. And then Mr. Cuddles was the first book I really did. Um, Mr. Cuddles, there's this. I have a couple Cuddles books out, um, but he's an angelically possessed teddy bear, protecting his family against zombies, vampires, and babysitters. Nah, <laughs> babysitters, nice. So it is a younger reader book. I try not to. I made a mistake early on where I did a, a story with a vampire and there was blood. Oh no. And that was a little too much for one of the, the younger readers. So I, you know, I, I, I've, Mr. Cuddles is, is probably the most family friendly safe thing in the, the catalog that I've done. You know, and, and again, it's everything I do is kind of like tongue in cheek. There's, there's usually puns and jokes and, you know, uh, one of the uh, things I did with Flatfoot is he was fighting a baker, uh, and you know, in a, a bakery setting. And over the course of four pages, I threw in as much bread baking puns <laughs> as I could. Pop. It got to the point to where I'm Googling puns and just trying to find as many ways to cram in dad jokes into this fight scene. And all the nooks and crannies, if you will. Yes. So let me ask you this then. I guess I didn't know you. Not only are you uh, drawing and painting, 
but you're also writing all the material as well. Yes. That's awesome. um, there's a, a, a couple of the shorts I, I had friends with come in and, and write some stuff. Uh, my first graphic novel was um, I had a friend write it because I didn't know if I could really trust myself yet. Yeah. Um, and he did a great job and um, you know, but it, it was a learning experience. Like, okay, I can do this and I can figure this out. And um, being dyslexic, I do have spelling issues. So my wife is my long suffering editor. <laughs> yeah. you know? I know how that is. What one time, uh, my wife, you've met Michelle, she literally mm -hmm. transcribed an entire interview for me. And I was like, okay, cool. She said she'd do it. I'm gonna let you do it. But uh, that was a very, as many, as many times as I tried to thank her, it was a thankless job. Yeah. My wife went over and edited all the, the stuff for the Kickstarter. And I'm like, I wrote this three months ago. So if you have a word that doesn't make sense, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> nice. You just have to figure, wing it. Wing it. We'll figure it. it out. Figure it out. Yeah. She's uh, in the book. She's also credited as my um, editor. That's um, cool. Because again, there was a, I wrote like three paragraphs per painting. And a lot of that makes it into the book and she's got to go in and fix my ramblings, my me rambling poetically about Bam Bam Bigelow. <laughs> I hope you have a lot of alliterations for Bam Bam Bigelow. I, I did the best I could. <laughs> well, uh, you know, with such a, with such a master, I, I didn't mean master, just a huge, uh undertaking this is i'm really excited to see what it's going to turn out to be uh i have been following you for a while i do see some of those posts that you put uh, have been putting up so i'm excited to see uh, all of this come into light and of course we'll be talking about it here uh, on the podcast as well as we'll put links onto the website for uh, folks to check it out but before we let you go and call it a night is there anything else you want to plug i do have your uh, uh your link tree in the chat plus i put it up here on the screen so that folks can easily find all of your socials and all that good stuff at link tree uh, forward slash destiny comics but is there anything else you want to plug before we say good night the main thing right now, because all of, if you're following me on any of my social medias, right now, the only thing that's getting plugged is the uh, the Kickstarter. So it's getting posted three, four times a day. Um, I apologize to the people who see every post, but the way the <laughs> algorithm works is not everyone sees every post. Right. Um, and that's that's a shame because you click follow and then you don't actually get to see the, some of the stuff I post. I, I'm not a fan of of some of that that algorithm nonsense yeah it's kind of a bummer and as being like a, a content creator as well i see it too where you'll post something and people will be like i i missed that really it's been on my instagram for months now you missed it but yeah yeah they miss it it's mm -hmm. real easy to miss yeah so um it, every day for the until the kickstarter ends a, I've I've done thirty little videos of like me uh, filming me painting like Ric Flair or filming me painting Harlem Heat or so every day you know it's a different video and it's a different subject but there's there's thirty days of um, me painting DDP or Arachnaman or you know. So uh, please follow, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff on on uh, my Instagram and um, also the Kickstarter. The main thing is the Kickstarter. And you have a YouTube page as well that I uh, yes, suggest I for some great voice impression work uh, that, that folks should check out your YouTube page. I was particularly fond of the Dusty promo. Let me tell you something, brother. My chest was pounding. It was late night. I didn't know what to do, brother. <laughs> I had to get up and I had to grab the paintbrush because the paint was flowing, brother. That's awesome, man. Oh. So, again, uh, linktree.com, Destiny Comics, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you know, get out there, YouTube, get out there, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, please, if you could, uh, make a donation of any amount to the Kickstarter, of course. Um, you know, if you want to get some cool items, you're going to want to pay a little bit more than just the, uh, 
uh, standard pledge, but $10 will get you a digital copy of the book. And, you know, that in and of itself is worth it because the book itself is going to be very cool. And I'm so 200, over, over 200 pages, over 200 pages. That's less than a dollar a page. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you can't give to the Kickstarter, I understand times are share the link. Yeah. Just you know, help, help spread the word. We're, you know, four years worth of work. And um, I'd love to see this not just fade to the background of Kickstarter. Very much so. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for your time. I wish you nothing but the best of luck on this. And that's going to do it for us, guys. Again, I'll be back here tomorrow with the pre-party. And then on Wednesday, it'll be the other Alliance guys. And then on Thursday, we'll be talking more NWA on uh, the Alliance guys podcast. But until next time, we'll see you guys at the matches. Thanks for joining the stream. This has been a presentation of Alliance-Wrestling.com. We genuinely appreciate your support. Would you consider subscribing so you'll never miss a future episode? I'd also like to remind you we do a live stream every Tuesday at 5 p.m. for NWA Power. You can find us on social media at The Alliance Blog. And until next time, we